Okay. Happy Friday. <laughs> so we're going to be working on local bond theory today and talking about that. But I want you to sort of wake up, try to try to clear your mind this morning. And we're going to be doing something very important today that you've probably never done in your chemistry career. Okay? And that is to actually try to analyze and think about what makes a theory. Okay, most of the time you're in class, you're, you're passive. And you just sort of absorb what is presented to you. You write down as much of, of the facts as you can. You try to internalize that for exams or for papers and so on. But you never put your mind in the, the role of a scientist who's trying to explain the phenomena that they see. You've depended upon us to do that and just present it to, the, to you. And so what you get is you get these theories that seem to you much more concrete than they really are. Right? The theory is presented to you and you trust us, and that's great. We're the professors, right? You trust us to present to you the most concrete example of the way to think about the data. Okay? But not everything's concrete. You know, you're going to hear today some things that you learned in freshman chemistry, and you're going to see direct evidence against that. And a lot of times they're like, wait a second, why, why did you tell us that? And then you tell us later that that's wrong. And so when I'm talking about concreteness, I'm thinking about concrete thinking. The whole thing is all right or all wrong, and that's not the case in theories. Theories may explain some data points and not others. And so today, we're really going to focus on two theories of bonding. We have local bond theory and molecular orbital theory. And they have strengths and weaknesses. But we've never really presented this in the chemistry curriculum to the, up to this point. And so we're going to talk about local bond theory and the supporting evidence for that. And then we're going to show the results of molecular orbital theory and show the supporting evidence and how it supports molecular orbital theory. And then, beginning next lecture, we're going to get in and, and actually do molecular orbital theory from the bottom up, starting with dihydrogen, you know, two electrons, two molecular orbitals. But today, I really, my goal for today is twofold. I want you to get your mind around how we evaluate theories. Okay. And this will really help you, not just in uh, science, but in anything. When somebody gives you a theory, you need to be able to evaluate it. You need to be able to think, what does this explain and what does this not explain? And if it doesn't explain everything, that's fine. Rarely does a theory explain everything. Uh, and so we'll learn some tools this morning about how to, how to compare theories, what makes a good theory good and what makes a theory weak. And so let's go through that. So this start with local bond theory. This is the bonding theory you grew up with <laughs> as a chemist. Okay, each bond has two electrons, so this is nothing new for you, right? And those two electrons are between the bonded atoms. That's the local part of local bond theory. So you've got an oxygen and a hydrogen and an OH bond, and you put two electrons, you draw a dash, and that dash represents two electrons, and that's holding those two atoms together. That's local bond theory. Okay, and then we have this eight electron rule, which sort of takes into account the noble gas configuration. Remember we did electron configurations and the ionization energies for the noble gases was the highest of any period. So you go along the period, uh, periodic table and you get to the noble gas and that has the highest uh, first ionization energy. So something about that eight electron cloud is really stable. And then in, in inorganic, we can expand that to the 18 electron rule because we get to the, the transition metals and we have now 18 electrons. But this rule is really uh, focused mostly on those top two rows, or actually the top, the second row, the carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. And so that's where this octet rule comes from. And so that's a very specific rule and it's really specifically applied to carbon, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. We don't really apply the octet rule to the third row. Like we let sulfur expand and have, you know, 10 electrons around it instead of just eight in sulfuric acid and sulfur hexafluoride. It's got, uh, it's got 12 electrons around it. Okay. And so this is sort of the local bond theory should be very familiar to you. So let's practice. This local bond theory gives us the Lewis dot structures. We've been doing this. We did this for the, um, 
for all of the symmetry. We made the Lewis dot structures, we generated the Vesper shapes, and so these are the rules again. We sum the electrons, the valence electrons that those atoms bring in. We create a single bond framework, so we bond everything together with single bonds. And then we subtract two electrons for each of those single bonds from the total. And then whatever we have left, we place non-bonded electrons on the most electronegative atoms first. And then we subtract those from the, the electron total. And then if any of them remain, we have no other choice really but to, by symmetry, just stick them on the central atom. Okay. Um, a lot of times we don't have enough electrons to form octets, and so that's where the double bonds come from. So if carbon dioxide, we have carbon, we have the oxygens, we put the extra electrons on the oxygens, and now carbon only has four electrons. And so then we share two more from each side, and so then we have the double bonds from the oxygens. And then we'll use VSEPR, the valence shell, electron pair, so see electron pair, that pair part, that's the local bond part of VSEPR theory. So valence shell, electron pair repulsion is how we come up with the 3D shapes. And we just try to get all those bonded electron domains and the non-bonded domains as far apart as possible. So if we have four electron domains, we make a tetrahedral electronic structure. If we have two, like in CO2, it's linear. Uh, water's not linear because we have those non-bonded pairs. And so we have a tetrahedral electronic structure around oxygen, but just a bent molecule because there's only three atoms. And so let's practice with this. So doing every step, um, you know, explicitly, I've got two electrons from the hydrogen and six from the oxygen, so I have eight electrons total. I form the single bond network. I know it's going to be bent, but... Well, let's just make it like a freshman, okay? All right, so we have this molecule. We made this single bond network. We subtract two electrons for each of those, two and four, so minus four electrons. Those are bonding, okay? So we have four electrons left, and we put those on the most electronegative element which again is to the upper right hand corner of the periodic table, not including the noble gases. So we get up to fluorine, that's the most electronegative. Oxygen is very close to that, uh, definitely more electronegative than hydrogen. And so then we subtract those, and I'll call those non-bonding, okay. and we end up with zero. So we've used all of our electrons, and we have this structure. So then we have four electron domains, That gives us a tetrahedral electronic structure. Whoa, clicked. Okay, and then that that produces a bent molecule. So that's the full Vesper and Lewis dot structure theory together. That's how we come up with these molecules. Then we can take this molecule through the flow chart, come up with the point group, and so on. So we did all of this in the past. It's a bit of review. So that's why, you know, today it says review. We're doing some review here. Uh, we'll have a Kahoot on this, but the Kahoot's going to push you forward a little bit. We could do the same thing for CO2. For time, I'd like to just run down here to, to the end result. So... Um, using the same theory and same practice, we, well, let's go ahead and do it because we got the double bonds, okay? So we have four electrons for the carbon and 12 for two oxygens, okay? So four and 12 is 16. Single bonds first, okay? So minus four bonding electrons. So we have 12 left, so 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So there's my 12 electrons in BE. 
And then now we're dealing with carbon and oxygen, and they require an octet. So this is that special rule that's been added. So this, this rule, why did we add this rule? Well, because these bonds were shorter. They seem to have a higher force constant vibrationally. And so we decided these look like double bonds. So how can we make double bonds come out of the Lewis dot structure? It was the octet rule that's causing us to make these double bonds. Okay, so the octet rule was, was developed so that we could explain the smaller bond lengths the tighter bond force constants and so on. We can't see the atoms. We can't see the molecules. So we've got to figure out a way to match the experimental data. So this, this octet rule is what we call ad hoc, right? We didn't have to use this octet rule for water. It just naturally gave us the shape of water. We get the CO2 and now we've got a problem. It doesn't explain the bond strength and it doesn't explain the bond lengths. And so we've got to come up with a rule to fix that problem. And so that's where the octet rule came from. So in order to give carbon uh, some, double, some double bonds, we're going to move two more. And we can share two more electrons from the oxygens. And so then we end up with this structure. And so in terms of Vesper shape, we have two electron domains, and so then they form a linear structure, both linear electronic structure and a linear molecular structure. Notice my words. I'm using two different types of structures, electronic structure and molecular structure. Now, I explained that when we were doing symmetry, but I want to emphasize that again. A lot of people get really confused, and it makes me crazy when they, when they hear me say that water has a tetrahedral electronic structure, and then they call it a tetrahedral molecule. It's a common mistake, and it's one that, like, I see red when I hear that. Because <laughs> it can't be a tetrahedral molecule. There are only three atoms. So since there's only three atoms, we use the atoms to, to label the molecular structure. So for all of those symmetry things, we're dealing with the molecular structure, okay? Not the electronic structure. But the electronic structure gives us the molecular structure, okay? Like in water, the electronic structure around the oxygen is tetrahedral. And so then the hydrogens are at two corners of that tetrahedron. And so then for the molecule, the molecular structure, it's a bent molecule. And then for CO2, it's linear both, linear electronically and a linear molecular structure. So this should be all happy. OK. Now, one thing we haven't really done in the local bond theory is to look at these two molecules and decide how many types of electrons we have. And that's going to be a new thing that we need to look at today. So look in water and tell me how many types of electrons you have. Okay. It looks like just two types of electrons. There's, a, there's an OH bonding electron and there's a non-bonded electron. OK, now look at CO2. How many types of electrons do we have? Are the, the double bonds, um, is the first bond and the second bond the same? No. So that's two types of electrons, one for the first bond, one for the second bond. Okay, so those double bonds count for two types of electrons, and then you have the non-bonded. So you have three types of electrons in CO2. So write that down, because and explain it to yourself in your notes. For CO2, you have three types of electrons, because the double bond You've got a single bond, and then you've got the pi bond, sigma and pi, uh, which we'll explain later. Okay, but you've had organic chemistry. You know what a sig sigma and a pi bond are. <laughs> you better. <laughs> okay, so the sigma electrons and the pi electrons are different, so they classify as two different types of electrons and then the non-bonded electrons. So that CO2 has three types of electrons. Water has two types of electrons from the local bond theory. And so that's going to be a, a point of difference with molecular orbital theory. So that's why I'm emphasizing it right now. I'm trying to build a little bit of a, a um, point of difference with MO theory. So let's take these. If we look at these molecules, water's bent, CO2's linear, and we can go to the, the infrared spectrum, and we can see the ramifications of that. So we can see the, the uh, stronger than, un, than expected bond for... Uh, CO2 based upon the frequency of vibration. 
So we can tell from the force constant that CO2 has a higher vibrational frequency than we would expect if it was a single bond. So, so the double bond from the octet rule explains the, the vibrational spectra, the location of that peak, and then the rotational lines, the rho vibrational lines, the R and P branches, uh, tell us that CO2 is linear and tell us that water is not linear, that it's asymmetric. And you can tell because you don't see in water very, you don't see clean P and R branches. All right, that's what a symmetric molecule would give, a very nice P branch and a nice R branch, and water has really got three overlapping P and R branches. It's a very complicated spectrum because it has three different rotational constants. Okay. So local bond theory supports the data, or it helps explain the data, or matches the data for vibration and rotation. So that's great. And we, you know, we use symmetry to explain these spectra. The local bond theory helped us get the symmetries right. And so then once we had the symmetries right, then the spectra was good. Okay. Now let's look at the electron cloud. How do we probe the electron cloud? Well, remember the, one of the first experiments that, uh, that showed the need for quantum mechanics was photoelectron, the photoelectric effect. You hit a molecule or a metal surface with photons and electrons come off. And if it's an energetic enough photon, like UV or X-ray, you can send those electrons off with different kinetic energies. And those kinetic energies uh, for a metal, because metals are all delocalized, you didn't really see uh, distinct peaks. You just saw a, you know, a current of electrons coming off that surface. If you put a molecule in here like water, you'll actually see the different types of electrons. And so if we put water down on this cold surface and we hit it with x-ray light, at a certain energy, kinetic energy, we'll see electrons that come from the OH bonds. And a certain energy, we'll see electrons that come off from, from the non-bonded electrons. At least in theory, that's what we should see. Because they're held to the nucleus or between the atoms. And, and so when we hit it with x-rays, the, the bonding electrons should come off at a different binding energy than the non-bonded electrons. Now, how do we sort the energies of the electrons? It's pretty simple because they're charged particles and they have a fixed mass. So these are electrons. So we know the mass and we know the charge. And so all we got to do is make them turn a corner. <laughs> okay? And so this, these hemispheres that we see here are positively charged. And it's a high vacuum, 10 to the minus 7 millibar. So that's uh, 10 to the, let's see, 10 to the minus 10 bar, which is close to an atmosphere. So one ten billionth of an atmosphere pressure. So the electrons can go all the way through here. There's no, ga there's no gas in there for them to run into. And we have a big positive charge on this side of the device and a big negative charge on that side of the device. So this negative electron comes out of our sample, goes through these little pinch optics to get it onto this slit, and then it goes around this turn and hits our detector. And that's when it's tuned to the energy for that electron. Now, if you change the charge, you pick a different energy that'll make it through. And so you just sweep the charge, and you see all the different binding energies. And so let's do this. Let's put water in there, hit it with x-rays or UV. Um, the electrons come off the water, and then we scan our analyzer. And we should see a peak for the lone pair electrons and a peak for the OH bonding electrons. And so what we're doing is sweeping the charge on our analyzer, and we're seeing the energies of the electrons in the molecule. So this is sort of digging down into the molecule. When we reach a part, a layer where we have uh, the energy of an electron, we'll pull those electrons out, and we'll see where they are in terms of energy. And then we go a little deeper in energy, and we get an, other electrons. So this is just a way to probe through the molecule and see what are the energies of the electrons. If we have two types of electrons, we ought to have two peaks. So we ought to have a burst of electrons when we hit the energy for the lone pairs, and we ought to have a burst of electrons when we hit the energy of the bonding electrons. So this is what local bond theory would predict, two peaks, because there's two types of electrons. Is everybody clear? Once you know the types of electrons, then you can predict what this theory would give in the electron spectrum. So let's take a cahoot on that. So you guys get tested on your ability to predict what kind of peaks would be in a molecule from local bond theory.
Okay, the code is 74313. 27. Hmm. One more. All right, let's go. That was the fastest ever. Good job. Okay, so this molecule here is the electron cloud, local bond electron cloud for ethene. So you can look up there and see ethene. So the two carbons are here in the middle, right here, the carbon and carbon, and then the four hydrogens around. You can see the pi bond. Okay, and so we're looking at this molecule. How many UVPS, UV photoelectron spectroscopy peaks are predicted by local bond theory. And this is a picture of local bond theory. Those are hybrid orbitals, the sp2 hybrids. All right, fantastic. So. <clears throat> what are the three valence band UVPS peaks in ethene? So hopefully you can see that. The red is a sigma HH, a sigma CH, and a pi CH. The blue is a sigma CH, a sigma CC, and a pi CC. Uh, the yellow is sigma HH, sigma CH, and sigma CC. And the green is sigma HH, sigma CH, and pi HH. <coughs> yeah, some of those don't make any sense. That's <laughs> Which is the point. I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> All right, very good. So we got a sigma carbon hydrogen, sigma carbon carbon, and a pi carbon carbon. Those are the three types of bonds that we have in this molecule. Here's the picture again. So this is one type of electron for the sigma bond, another pi, uh, type of electron for the pi bond, and then even though there's four CH bonds, that's a one type. That's one type of electron because they're in the same chemical environment. So this would predict three UVPS peaks. How many valence band peaks would, would LB theory predict for CO2? So there's CO2. Okay. Those of you who picked two may have not seen the, the lone pairs because they're typically not drawn. So people are lazy. They just draw the double bonds. They leave off the lone pairs. Lone pairs are a real pain to do in terms of drawing a molecule. It's easy to put an equal sign there, but then the dots, you know, so a lot of times it's just practical. They'll leave them off, and, and you can't forget that they're there. Okay. Question four. How many valence band UVPX would LB predict for water if the oxygen is sp3? So pay attention to that. If the oxygen is sp3. So let's look at this. What do I mean by that oxygen is sp3? That's the traditional way, right? Oxygen has four electron domains around it. And so it would have four equal domains. You'd need four orbitals to go with that. So you would hybridize an S and three Ps. So sp3 would be the hybridization on an oxygen with four electron domains around it. But you know, what if you put two electrons in the unused P orbital? and treated it as if it were sp2. So if oxygen were sp2, how many uh, peaks would you get in the, in the UVPS? Do you remember the name of the Vesper shape for that, the electronic structure for an sp2 carbon or sp2 um, molecule? It's a trigonal bipyramid. There's no trigonal, trigonal planar, trigonal planar. Yep. And so, if that oxygen were trigonal planar, 
you would have a lone pair in the plane with the two hydrogens, and then you'd have a lone pair that was in the PZ orbital. Okay. And so it'd be kind of in the front and the back, sort of a non-bonding pair that's in the plane and a non-bonding pair that's out of the plane. So we need to think about other options, perhaps. If we look at the UVPS for, for water and we saw three peaks, how would we explain that? You might say, wow, our hybridization may be a little off for this molecule. We predicted an sp2 oxygen, but we could write the same thing with an sp3. And the experiment's telling us maybe that's the lowest energy structure. Because I'm, I'm just priming the pump here for you to think about other <laughs> options. Yes? So even though they're both non-bonding, if they're in separate... Yeah, they would be different types of electrons, yeah. yeah. And so that was, the, that was the way I was trying to, to get to that. An S, a PZ pair of electrons would be different than a SP hybrid pair of electrons. Follow? Okay. Excellent. Okay, so that's the code. So that gets you thinking in terms of what local bond theory would give us in the electronic structure experiment of photoelectron spectroscopy. So we hit it with high energy photons, electrons come out, we see a certain number of peaks. Those peaks tell us how many different types of electrons we have. Okay. Okay, excellent. So now going back to our, uh, our PowerPoint. This is what water for molecular orbital theory gives us in terms of the different types of electrons. You've already seen this in the lab. We've talked about it in class quite a bit, but we haven't really emphasized MO theory because that's coming up. But think about the difference just in the words of the theories. You hear these things, these terms go by, but, but if you don't engage your mind into what you're actually hearing in your vocabulary, then some of these subtleties can be missed. Local bond theory, the local part is that the electrons are local to a bond. It's right in the name. So between that oxygen and hydrogen, there's two electrons holding those two atoms together. That's local bond theory. Think about molecular orbital theory. These are the molecular orbitals. These pictures came from Gaussian, but you can generate these by hand, you know, roughly the same pictures. And notice that none of those electrons are local to any two atoms. They're over the whole molecule. That's why the name is molecular orbital theory. Every orbital goes over the whole molecule. <coughs> Make sense? Molecular orbital theory, the orbitals go over the whole molecule. And so there is no real orbital that says it's bonding these two atoms together. Now we, we can kind of see that in a diatomic because there's only two atoms. And so when we go into the diatomic um, uh, molecular orbital theory, you'll see, you know, some electron density right between the atoms, say, in a, in a, in a uh, PZ endon interaction. But once you get beyond a diatomic, you get this. And you get molecular orbitals that go over the whole molecule. And you can't really assign these two electrons are bonding this OH, and those two electrons are bonding this OH, and those two electrons are the, you know, non-bonding pairs although we can find one non-bonding pair up here, that B1 orbital. Okay. But this is quite a different electronic structure. Right? We're trying to figure out what's the structure of the electron cloud. The, the molecular structure hasn't changed. It's still bent. Okay. But what's the structure of the electron cloud? Well, we can use photoelectron spectroscopy for this. So if I hit this with UV photons, how many peaks am I going to get? How many different types of electrons are there here? I see a few people adding it up. Okay. How many different types? So when I say different types, how many different energies are there for my electrons? I have eight electrons. Do I have eight different energies? No. I've got four different energies. You see the energy levels. Each one of those molecular orbitals is a wave function, and that wave function has a certain energy. You do the Schrodinger equation, you get the energies. And so every one of those molecular orbitals has a distinct energy, and there's two electrons in each. So we have eight electrons, but I've only got four different types, four different occupied molecular orbitals. And each one of those is a different energy. And we label them with their symmetry. So we use the molecular structure to come up with the symmetry. That tells us the symmetry of the electron cloud. And these different wave functions have those symmetries. A1 is the lowest one, and A1, another A1, and then a B2 and a B1. And then there's a 1s orbital on the oxygen, which is down below. <laughs> okay. 
So we'd have to use x-rays to get to that one. And we can do that. So now let's go into our experiment. We put water under there, and we uh, actually do the experiment this time instead of predicting it, and this is what we get. We get four peaks. So for local bond theory, we predicted two peaks, maybe three if we had sp2 oxygen, but we could never predict four, not with local bond theory. So the experimental results actually show us that there are four different energies for the electrons in this electron cloud. Not three, not two. And they're labeled in the literature. So let's go to the literature. Here's the actual paper, okay, where this data was, was uh, done. This is 1986, okay. And so here's our molecular orbital diagram, and there's the experimental spectrum. And the paper has them labeled exactly how Gaussian gave us our labels. And down at the bottom was A1, and then we saw that A, they have some twos and threes and stuff in front. Don't know what that's about. I, you know, it's in the paper. But that top peak is that non-bonded electron pair, which is in an unused PZ orbital, or P, actually it's the PX orbital coming out of the plane of the tape, the board. And then that, that A1, uh, sort of no nodes, the lowest bonding <coughs> molecular orbital, and then they actually switch. So Gaussian just has a different order for those middle two. They're close enough in energy that, that uh, the experiment tells us that the, um, the A1 is lower than, let's see. Yeah, the A1 is lower than, the, the A1 is higher than the B1 actually. So Gaussian has them swapped. And so what the bottom line is we get four valence band peaks and then we have that oxygen 1S, which is what we call a core bonding, a core electron, not a bonding electron, but a core electron. So when I talk about the valence band, I'm talking about just those bonding electrons, antibonding electrons, the valence shell. So it's the, the, the uh, 2P and 2, 2P, uh, 2S and 2P electrons on oxygen and the 1S electrons on the hydrogens. There's eight of those. Uh, they pair up, and so we have four different peaks in the molecular orbital theory. So that's, that's pretty cool that we can actually probe the structure of the electron cloud using the photoelectric effect. And this was one of the things that classical physics couldn't explain was this photoelectric effect, and now we're using it to understand the electron cloud around a molecule. So how do we evaluate theories? You know, all theories have this. So this is stepping back. So set local bond theory and molecular orbital theory aside for a second. Let's just talk about the word theory, okay? How do we decide if the theory is good or bad. Naturally, theories explain things. So explanatory power is good. If you have a lot of power to explain the nuances of, uh, of the data, then that's, that's good. So this question is, how well does the theory match the data in the training set? What do I mean by training set? Well, this is the data that you have, and you come up with a theory to, pre to explain that data. And if it hits all of the all of the data points, then that's really good. That's explanatory power. It has the power to explain every little bump and wiggle in the spectrum or in the data that you've collected. Okay? And then we have explanatory scope. How large is the training set and how diverse is the training set? So if you have data that's just uh, rotational um, spectra, your theory may explain that. But that's not very diverse. You don't have vibration in there. You don't have electronic in there. So your theory is only explaining one small piece, just the rotational piece. Okay. So if it has a big scope, it can explain different types of data. That's fantastic, right? Not just that it explains a small set of data really well, but it explains a large data set and of different types of experiments. That would be fantastic if you could get a theory that would explain different types of experiments different, um, and, and explain them very well. And then this, this is a weird one, ad hocness. So ad hoc is Latin for, for this, <laughs> okay? So you might hear of an ad hoc committee. It's a special committee for a particular problem. So they form a committee for this problem. So ad hoc, that's where I first heard that word. And in evaluating theory, you don't want too many exceptions. You don't want to have to pay attention to all these little exceptions. Oh, I forgot, when we have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, we need an octet. But if we have sulfur, no big deal. I can bond it to six things. Okay? And so 
um, does the theory have lots of exceptions or special cases? If so, this is not good. So you don't want a large ad hoc. You want a low ad hoc. You want no special cases if possible. Explains a large data set and a diverse data set. That would be a great theory. So now let's evaluate local bond theory. Its explanatory power is big, and that's good. So it explains the shapes accurately and can model molecular structures. We used it to explain the symmetry of all of our molecules and never had to worry about its electron cloud being inaccurate. So local bond theory is great if you're just coming up with the structure of a molecule. You did all of organic chemistry with local bond theory. Pretty good. Okay. Um, its explanatory scope has a big hole in it, though. It's great for rotational spectra. It can tell me that water's bent and CO2 is linear, and they both have three atoms. Okay. That explains also the vibrational features in terms of uh, the CO2 having a double bond and water having single bonds and other kinds of things. So it's pretty good with vibrational spectra. The symmetries that I get from local bond theory help me explain all of those things. Even NMR, we haven't talked about NMR, but it can help predict what chemically equivalent um, atoms, okay? But it doesn't match electronic spectroscopy. That's the gaping hole. So if I'm talking about the electron cloud and how bonding occurs, okay, it really reactions, how reactions occur, I'm gonna need molecular orbital theory. Now you did a lot of reactions in organic chemistry but a lot of them have some wonky explanations, <laughs> right? And it was difficult because how do you know if this exception, you know, applies here and that exception applies there? Now that may be revealing some of my bias as a P chemist, but organic chemistry, I was like, come on, you know. I mean, there were some rules and things, but it makes a lot more sense after I've learned molecular orbital theory and could understand sort of the structure of the electron cloud then these reactivities made a lot more sense. And then uh, ad hocness, local bond theory has that octet rule. I mean, that whole kind of thing is, is an ad hoc fix to explain double bonds in, in, in carbon-based molecules. So molecular orbital theory can do all of these things. It can accurately give the structures. It gives the same structures that local bond theory gives. It matches all of the spectra. And there are no real special cases for molecular orbital theory. We don't have any issues where we have to say, oh, gee, this is a particular atom. We need to think about it this way. Okay. So molecular orbital theory is great. does it all. So why don't we throw away local bond theory? How do we choose? Well, this is easy and this is not easy. <laughs> okay. So you go with the theory that's appropriate based upon how much work you want to use. <coughs> now, if I've got a computer at my disposal and I want to come up with the structure of a molecule, I'll build it and let Gaussian use molecular orbital theory. And that's easy because the computer is doing all the tedious work. But if I'm trying to just build molecules like water or CO2 or even, you know, caffeine like my tie, I'm going to use local bond theory if I'm doing it by hand. And so if you're doing it by hand for molecular structures, use local bond theory. I'm not taking that away from you. Okay, that's a good theory. And if you're going to teach, teach it. It's a good theory because it covers so much, okay? And it, it helps explain rotation and vibration. <laughs> We've done it, you know, done vibration and rotation with local bond theory up to this point, okay? Uh, but then if you get into electronic structure, you need molecular orbital theory. So if you really want to know what the electron cloud is doing, then you've got to take into account the mixing of atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals. We'll use symmetry to do that. So we, we, by hand, will use local bond theory to get the structure. We'll use the symmetry of that structure to mix the atomic orbitals together. But once we've mixed the atomic orbitals to make molecular orbitals, now we're in MO theory. So local bond theory builds a bridge that we can then use to get to molecular orbital theory and understand what those pictures are that we had for water. Okay, so we do kind of use both in conjunction, but when we start talking about building up that electron cloud, we're in the molecular orbital realm where the molecule has an orbital. The whole molecule has an orbital. And there's two electrons in each one of those orbitals. And that's explained by the UV and X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy. So that's how we choose. So let's go for questions. There's quite a lot of material in, in 
in this lecture. So if you need clarification on anything like the UV photoelectron spectroscopy experiment or, or the differences between molecular orbitals and local bonds, now's the time. We've got about four minutes. Yes? Could you like, give a brief uh, <coughs> description of the difference between the two periods? The brief description is just in the names, the local versus molecular. Okay. So if you focus on those two things, they're telling you everything you need to know. Local bond is two electrons between two atoms. Yeah, whereas molecular, the whole, the whole molecule has an orbital. Okay. Yeah, and, and the way we made the bonding orbitals was with hybridization theory. We don't have that in molecular orbital theory. We don't make sp2 hybrids or sp3 hybrids or anything like that. That is... The, that is the way we've taken local bond theory and sort of squeezed the atomic orbitals into something that would give us angles that were not 90 degrees, right? And you can do that mathematically, but it doesn't hold up in terms of symmetry. And we'll see that in the next few lectures. We'll compare again later Waters' MO versus LB theories, and you can force Gaussian to do the hybridization but it doesn't fit with the symmetry of the molecule and it doesn't give the correct energies. Okay, but yeah, that's the main difference, local versus molecular. Yeah. Time for one more. Okay, so for a triple bond, is that still considered a... Oh, good question. Uh, two different pairs? Uh, so the triple bond, like acetylene, really the, the one triple bond is maybe this way and the other triple bond is that way. And so... Uh, a double, there's two double bonds. There's a single bond and then two double bonds. And the two double bonds would be the same energy. So for acetylene, you would have one type of electron for the CH bonds, okay? A second type of electron for the CC single bond. And then a third type of bond for the two pi bonds. So those two pi bonds would have the same energy. So for acetylene, you'd have three types of electrons, even though you have... Uh, really four dashes. You have dashes between the CHs and then three dashes between the two carbons. But those three dashes between the two carbons really count for two bonds. There's a sigma and there's two pi's, but the two pi's would have the same energy. And that's what you would predict with local bond theory. And if you go to the, uh, the X-ray photoelectron spectroscopy, you would not see three peaks. You would see many peaks for acetylene. And we could probably find that in the literature pretty easily. All right. Have a great weekend.